Oh, bonjour. I mean, everybody, I'm so excited to be here. I um, have the honor of um, doing book talk with Rebecca Rowan Horse. And so before we start, I have an introduction. And then we'll get started. So <clears throat> welcome to Book Club with Rebecca Rowan Horse. My name is Don Quigley. Um, I'm a PhD, longtime educator, um, now in higher ed, and I'm also a citizen of the Turtle Mountain Band of Ojibwe. I am a um, lover of Native uh, Indigenous books, especially for children. I also am an author myself. And so before I introduce tonight's guest properly, please let me tell you a little bit more about the unique series that is being um, brought to us and how Rebecca came um, to the book club. Book club is a program of MELSA, the Metropolitan Library Service Agency made possible through the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and coordinated by library strategies. That's part of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library. St. Paul Public Library is the co-organizer of this evening's talk. Thanks also to our fabulous indie bookseller, Red Balloon Bookshop. A purchase link to Favorite Star will be available in the comments section of this live stream feed. You can have it shipped, you can pick it up at their lovely store in St. Paul, or have them deliver it personally to your door if you're in the area. Our final housekeeping note is in the comments you'll see a survey link, and Melissa would greatly appreciate hearing what you think of this book club program. It's quick and easy and we really appreciate your feedback. So now for our featured event. In the words of the New York Times, Rebecca Roanhorse is prominent amongst the small court cohort of indigenous novelists reshaping North American science fiction, horror, and fantasy genres in which native writers have long been overlooked. Rowan Horse's speculative fiction, much as what's been informed by her indigenous heritage, has earned the genre's coveted Nebula, Hugo, Campbell, and Locus Awards. Titles of note include Trail of Lightning and Storm of Locus, the first two installments of the Six World Young Adult series. Rowan Horse is also a handful of writers invited to contribute to the popular Star Wars expanded universe. That's amazing. Her best-selling Star Wars Resistance Reborn is a canon prequel to the 2019 Black Buster film, The, the Rise of Star, Star, I'm sorry, The Rise of Skywalker. I'm so excited talking about that Miss Rebecca wrote a, a, for Star Wars. Uh, Roan Horse's latest, which we're going to talk about tonight, is the critically acclaimed Between Earth and Sky trilogy. Inspired by the pre-Columbian civilizations of America, the series offers a page-turning blend of political intrigue, celestial prophecies, and forbidden magic. Booklet, Booklist calls it perfect for those who love George R.R. R. Martin's series but crave a more diverse world. Fevered Star is the latest installment, and it hit shelves on April 19th. So after a short talk by Rebecca Roanhorse and some initial questions from me, we're going to have time for our audience Q&A. You can simply drop your questions in the comment thread here on Facebook, and our tech manager will route them to me. If you'd prefer to send something um, off of Facebook, you could also send it to Book Club here on Facebook, or you can send an email to bookclubmn at gmail.com. And so right now, I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca Roanhorse, and she's going to share um, just a little summary, a little background, um, talking about the new installment of her new series. Rebecca, so happy that you're here. Oh, thank you. And thank you for the intro, Dawn. It's very generous. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca Roanhorse. And I'm here to talk about Favorite Star, but you can't really talk about Favorite Star without talking about Black Sun. So Black Sun is this one. It's the first in the series. This is a trilogy. Uh, and you know, for those of you who may, or may not be quite as familiar or kind of wondering uh, what the background of these books uh, is, uh, this is really my 
my foray into epic fantasy. Uh, it, as Don mentioned, is inspired by the pre-Columbian uh, Americas, uh, different cultures in the pre-Columbian Americas, but it is not a history book. It is a fantasy. Uh, there are giant flying crows, there is magic, uh, there is all sorts of stuff going on, uh, but certainly sort of the root of the story, uh, the inspiration uh, was really my desire to shine a light on um, sort of uh, the various cultures of the pre-Columbian Americas, everyone from the Yucatec Maya to the ancestral Puebloans uh, to the mound builders of Cahokia. You know, I grew up reading epic fantasy. I still read epic fantasy. Uh, you know, reading things, I grew up reading like um, Susan Cooper's The Dark is Rising, uh, Lloyd Alexander's The Black Cauldron. I went on to read the Dragonlance Chronicles, which I love. If you see a little bit of Raceland in Seraphio, that is not an accident. Uh, gosh, you know, the Belgaria, the Melorian, and then later, of course, The Song of Ice and Fire, Eye of the World, Robert Jordan series. Uh, you know, and so all of these uh, really sort of in my, my imagination, in my bones, but I always wondered why you didn't come across, you know, these epic high fantasy set uh, in, uh, in the Americas or inspired by the Americas, you know, because all of the ones I mentioned, of course, are sort of inspired by medieval Europe or some version, some sort of fake version of Europe. Uh, and so really this series, the Between Earth and Sky series was my uh, sort of um, dream, I guess, to write the book that uh, I always wanted to read. Uh, and so uh, that's really what this series is. It's, it's the books that I wanted to read, full of sort of the tropes and the familiarity of the things you see in epic fantasy, but done with a little bit of a twist uh, and, and set in a world inspired by the Americas. It was wonderful. I always love to hear the insights of the inspirations and kind of the, the why of, um, of authors. So my first question, whenever I speak to authors, especially Indigenous authors, I always like to ask, um, you know, kind of thinking back um, into your own childhood, what was your relationship with books? Um, you know, there's a lot of oral, oral stories. Could you just speak about that? Um, especially if we have young um, viewers, we always like to hear about how our, our author superstars, you know, what did they read or what, what was their experience and, and relationship with story? Yeah, well, I mentioned some of those, some of my old favorites. Uh, and, you know, I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, I'm an adoptee, uh, so I grew up uh, in a family uh, that is not part of my uh, indigenous heritage. Uh, but my mother was an English teacher, uh, and she was a big believer in story and in reading, and so every weekend, especially through the summer, she would dump my brother and I at the local public library, uh, and we would spend the afternoon there, you know, collecting all the books that we could, you know, read at once. There was a limit, you know, how many you could check out back then, uh, and she'd pick us up a few hours later, and we'd have our books for, for the week or for the next couple of weeks. Uh, so story has always been uh, central, I guess, to my life, uh, and it has been a refuge, and, and it has been uh, fuel for my imagination. Uh, it's really, to this day, still probably the most important uh, sort of calling I feel that I have is to be a storyteller. Uh, and for me, that was in speculative fiction, that's in science fiction and fantasy. I was just drawn uh, to sort of the wonder and the possibility in these worlds, uh, whether you're looking sort of forward or, or backwards into sort of a revisionist uh, type of history uh, that, that centers sort of indigenous stories and centers uh, indigenous cultures, or whether you're looking forward into the future in science fiction. Uh, and again, you know, making sure that indigenous people exist in the future, uh, because you don't get a lot of that. <laughs> we seem to be missing. Uh, so um, yeah, I guess that was really, uh, you know, again, the stories that meant the most to me and that I wanted to tell or that I wanted to read and since they weren't there, or I couldn't find them at least, they're the stories I decided I wanted to tell. I love that. It, it just makes me think of, um, you know, writing for the 12 year old you, you know, the what you needed. Um, so speaking of writing, a lot of, um, a lot of our listeners are aspiring um, writers, um, and especially uh, we've got lots of um, um, young adults listening as well. Could you speak a little bit about, um, 
your journey? Did you go to school to be, I mean, I kind of know the answer, but I, I think it's always, I think it's really insightful when um, um, best-selling authors um, sort of share how they became a writer and an author. Yeah. So I won my first poetry contest in third grade. So I knew this was my destiny. No, I'm just kidding. And it is true. I did win the poetry contest. Uh, and then, you know, I was writing for myself through seventh and in eighth grade. I think I wrote my first epic fantasy and it was sort of terrible. It's, you know, it's, it's full of farm boys going on quests. I always say it's not a Tolkien knockoff. It's like a Tolkien knockoff knockoff. Uh, so uh, you know, and so writing was really just for me. Uh, I went to school, I went to Yale University, uh, but I did not study writing. I studied religious studies, um, sort of like world religions. And then uh, I have a master's degree in theology from Union Theological, which is part of Columbia. Uh, and so clearly <laughs> I was not thinking of writing as a profession. I'll be quite honest, you know, growing up and, you know, well, oh gosh, even until five, 10 years ago, I didn't know that women of color, that black and native women could write epic fantasy. That seemed like, you know, a white man genre, certainly dominating the field. And I had, at that time, I had not heard of uh, Octavia Butler. Uh, I was an Ursula Gwynn fan, you know, from the get-go. I love her work. Uh, but then I found Octavia's work and my mind just exploded. Uh, and then of course, N.K. Jemisin uh, and folks like that. Uh, and now the field is just booming. But uh, I came to writing, uh, I became an attorney. I went to law school as well after all of that uh, later in life. And so I was practicing actually working uh, with um, law firms that represent like native interests and uh, legal aid on the Navajo Nation. And, and then here uh, in the state of New Mexico, I worked uh, for the state. Uh, and lawyering was okay. <laughs> it was great. I did not think that was my calling. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I had a young child. I was working this, you know, sort of nine to five job that I did not find particularly fulfilling in the long run. And I decided to go back to writing. Uh, and so I started writing purely for myself, uh, for my own uh, sort of joy. Uh, and that the, those early pages, they weren't meant, you know, really for anyone to see but me. Uh, and I would usually write from 10 at night to two in the morning, you know, sitting by my infant daughter's bedside uh, on a TV tray with my little laptop. Uh, and the um, glamorous life of a writer. I know, right? <laughs> right now, really. now I do it. I'm like in my basement field. right now, you know, in Minnesota, <laughs> waiting for tornadoes to come. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, so yeah, that's that's how I got started. I joined a Nano Rimo group uh, one year. I'd heard of them. Could you, if, could you speak about what that is, just for maybe some um, for people who who could that could help? Sure. Uh, Nano Rimo stands for National Novel Writing Month. And every year in November, uh, a bunch of just regular folks decide to try to write a novel. Uh, mm -hmm. And not everyone does. And of course, I think the goal is like 50,000 words. And most novels, uh, adult novels are, you know, uh, quite a bit longer than that. Um, but it's really just to get people writing uh, mm -hmm. and to help to sort of discover the story that only you can tell. Because certainly everyone has a story that only they can tell. That they bring, you know, their own life experiences and and uh, their point of view to the page. Uh, and so I did that uh, mostly to just get me out of the house and to keep me going. Uh, and after I finished the novel, cause I did finish the novel, um, I joined uh, I, I, some of the NaNoWriMo uh, women that I was with, we, joined, we started a critique group, which is a group of people just get together and share your writing. Mm -hmm. And they were like, you know, this is pretty good. I think you could publish this. And I was they were thinking, right. <laughs> right. I was thinking, no way. Nobody wants to read this. This is just we. Yes, you know, so we did. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and but, that first uh, book was, could you remind us? Oh, Trail of Lightning. So this was Trail of Lightning uh, yes. that I wrote. Uh, it was the first book I ever wrote. And I, um, I decided to query it, which means you send it out to an agent. Uh, and I knew nothing about publishing. I live in New Mexico. Um, I, I wasn't part of that world at all. Uh, but I did a little research and I decided to, to query uh, some agents and I queried one agent uh, who loved the story. Um, she picked it up. Uh, she knew exactly the editor to send it to. We sold it in a week and, you know, we kind of went from there. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. And I actually love hearing about your background because definitely um, 
especially in the in, in this latest series, I mean, I can see your theology background. Yeah. Um, and so that's why I, I always love to hear kind of the the meandering paths of people who didn't get an MFA, you know, a master of fine arts and writing, because, you know, I, I love that your past experiences really have shaped your writing. And Absolutely. so speaking of that, um, we do have some amazing pre-submitted audience questions that I would love to ask you specifically about, um, well, oh my goodness, they're so excited. I think we could stay here for like three hours, but <laughs> so um, one of the things um, um, a reader asked is, um, I remember from an NPR interview that Dova, um, so one of the settings, um, is is so much else in the series draws directly from Mesoamerican traditions. And so would you be willing to um, provide, I'm just going to kind of meld my question as well, mm -hmm. like, um, why was that important for you to include that, uh, for example, I mean, th these amazing um, uh, ocean navigators and understandards of um, city planning and aqueducts and, and fertilizing. Yes, absolutely, exactly. Uh, so I mentioned before that, um, so, so well, let me step back one sec. So the, the series is set uh, around, in a world called the Meridian, which is a fictional world. Uh, but um, every fantasy writer's dream is to get maps. <laughs> So it, the, the book does have a map. <laughs> so I, I, I spent maps, but... hours looking at that one. And oh, um, yeah. did so you my see daughter, daughter did the first version. I was going to, so. oh, that, I love that. That makes it even more sweeter. I, I yeah. we love maps. Yes. Uh, but there are people called fantasy cartographers. And what, that's what they do. Their job is to make fantasy maps. So what my 12 year old daughter sketched got turned into this. And then also later this, she did Tova as well in the back. Uh, but you'll notice if you turn this just so, this looks a bit like the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and that's on purpose. Um, the rivers do run backwards as some like astute uh, uh, internet folks pointed out. Uh, but you know, my daughter did this first one and nobody caught it. So this is magic happening right here, the river's going backwards. Uh, but anyway, uh, so, you know, there's four cultures sort of centered, four city states sort of centered around uh, this body of water in the book. And each one is represented by a various uh, pre-Columbian culture. And it's not a one-to-one. -one. I did a lot of mixing. Uh, I was fast and loose with sort of the classical period versus, you know, the late classical and things like that. Uh, but Quecola um, at the bottom that looks like part of the, the Yucatan is inspired by the Yucatec Maya uh, and all the names and places are sort of uh, inspired by the language, although I did take liberties, it is not a one to one and it's not a history book I have to keep saying that. Uh, but if you get inspired and you want to learn about the actual cultures that uh, that gets me excited uh, and you can look in the back of black sun there's this very small sort of a uh, a list of some of my favorite books uh, that I referenced, uh, the re that I researched for uh, the series. So that's a good place to get started. Uh, but anyway, so let's go around the coast. You have Quecola and the Yucatec Maya. You have the uh, Ancestral Puebloans in Tova, uh, which is sort of inspired uh, by Mesa Verde and Chaco Canyon. But certainly the city of Tova, it is uh, described as a city in the clouds uh, on top of these great mesas and in the cliffs. And that's a little more Machu Picchu uh, in inspiration. Uh, you have Hokaia, uh, which was inspired by Cahokia. It's on a great river in the plains. Uh, Cahokia, of course, is the uh, mound building culture right outside of current St. Louis. Uh, one of the greatest uh, cities of the Americas uh, ever. <laughs> uh, and then you have the Teak and they're a little bit more mysterious. Uh, they're inspired a little bit more by uh, the indigenous cultures of the Caribbean uh, and um, the sailing methods. So one of the things in the book is uh, that I wanted to create a maritime culture uh, and I didn't know a whole lot about the maritime Maya. Uh, so I did have to do some research. Uh, scholars don't seem to know a whole lot, at least what I could find. And I had all kinds of people sending me papers and like, here's this and here's that. But I did try to uh, base, for example, uh, their shipbuilding methods on um, indigenous shipbuilding methods. Their navigational systems uh, are inspired uh, by um, uh, 
the uh, nav nav navigational systems of the indigenous Pacific cultures. Uh, so that's sort of where all that came from. Now, why I did it, clearly it's to highlight all these cultures, like I mentioned before, you know, and as you said, Don, you know, here, you know, in America, it seems like we don't really value uh, our pre-European, pre-conquest history uh, the way that we should. Uh, but here were these cultures that were master city planners, uh, master astronomers. Uh, you know, they built sewer systems, you know, that when the Spanish arrived, you know, when London was still throwing their, their poop in the streets, you know, the, the Aztecs had built, you know, a sewer system throughout a massive city that was bigger uh, than London at the time. Uh, and of course, the Spanish were blown away. Like if you look at their accounts of their first encounters uh, with the cultures there, they're like, whoa, these people are so advanced. Um, and, you know, they, uh, so, so all of this stuff, the, the city planning, the architecture, uh, the, the mapping of the, the heavens, you know, and all of that, uh, I just really wanted to highlight it. I wanted people to, to get excited about it, to, to go and find the actual history and, and read about, you know, the sort of uh, cultures uh, that did this, because I don't think most of us learn about it in school. Uh, and we certainly don't seem to uh, learn about it much of anywhere else. So if a fantasy book can inspire you to maybe go do a little more digging, uh, then that's awesome. Then maybe I've, I've done a little extra more than what my job is. <laughs> you absolutely have. I think, you know, what, you know, sort of a, um, um, an homage to our indigenous ancestors, you know, the fact that uh, pre-Columbian, um, one of my favorite books is like, it's called 1491 and it, it shows, um, it's just the children's version. And I'm so bad with authors. I, as an author, I, me too. Don't worry. I'll, <laughs> okay. I will hold you to um, it. <laughs> but, but, you know, I think one of the things is that it's so important, like what you're doing, and I was really taken in about um, the, um, the, the connection with earth and land and understanding how that works. Um, I think about all these, these horrific wildfires out West mm -hmm. um, and the fact that, you know, indigenous people, we had a system, um, you know, to maintain. And so, um, um, our forests, and so that's I just love that you wrote that. Um, I have like a thousand questions here. Uh, one, one quick one um, from a, a, a audience member. Um, so, thinking about this new series, was there a main character that was hardest for you to write and or get in their headspace? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, the series is told in shifting p point of views. Uh, so, sort of each chapter. Uh, is told from uh, a different point of view. There's four characters that are point of view characters in Black Sun. Fevered Star adds a fifth. Um, and yeah, they're all sort of different. Uh, they come from, you know, different the four sort of different cultures that I mentioned, uh, or at least some of them, they overlap a bit. Uh, and uh, they each sort of are on their journey. Um, Oh, okay, sorry, there's a little note that popped up. I get oh, distracted. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I should say, as a good host, um, thank you. Um, it is um, Arthur, sorry. Da, 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 da. Oh, sorry. I think it was Charles C. Mann. That... Charles C. Mann, the author. Yes, I'm trying yes, to do too many tech things. I need like my 17 year old daughter here to like tell me what's going on. Um, but yes, it's a, a fantastic. Um, I, just as an educator, K-12 educator, I use the, it's children's version, but, um, you know, it, it, I, it, when I was reading your book, Rebecca, about um, all these amazing, just um, this knowledge, right, this indigenous knowledge of, of land and water, um, I, I thought about that, I just thought about that, and I, and I um, you know, I, I almost think that this could be um, brought into like a STEM class mm -hmm. um, as educators to really say like, okay, let's, let's pull apart. Like, what is the knowledge here? So that's my, I'm going to get off my soapbox <laughs> like here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so just to answer that POV question. Uh, so the four main characters, uh, Serapio, who's sort of a young man uh, that has been uh, raised outside of his culture, uh, but is now uh, supposed to return and sort of uh, become their savior. Uh, he, he believes that he is uh, the vessel for a god. Uh, and whether or not that's true, we'll see. <laughs> Stay tuned, right? <laughs> uh, but it's certainly how he was raised. Uh, 
Uh, yes. Uh, and then uh, there's Shiala. She's my sea captain from the maritime culture that I mentioned. Uh, and she has sort of secret powers of her own, but she has been um, uh, banished from her culture for a crime that is unclear uh, in Black Sun and then becomes more clear in Fevered Star. Uh, there is Narampa. Uh, she is my uh, character from the wrong side of the tracks. She grew up poor in the city of Tova and uh, has risen to power to become uh, the sun priest, uh, which is a, a, a position of great prestige. Uh, but her problem, of course, is that uh, all, the, all the snobs, <laughs> basically, in the tower don't accept her as one of them. Uh, so she is sort of a woman who loves an institution that does not love her back. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, there's a Koa who is sort of a son of privilege. And I always tell my editor, he's my Hamlet. He's trying to figure out the right thing to do, but he doesn't know what it is. Uh, so he's sort of a hot mess. Uh, and then later in Fevered Star, you add the point of view of Balaam. Uh, and I don't want to give anything away about him uh, in case you haven't read Fevered Star, but he is a bit of a mastermind. And he is sort of your political, uh, he's your po politico, I guess. And so he's got his fingers in all kinds of uh, pies, pulling all kinds of strings. Uh, and you only start to see the full sort of breadth of his planning as you get deeper into Fevered Star. Uh, and then of course the third book, you know, everything will explode and you'll you'll get to see what happens to everyone. Yeah, I've decided, we have decided that you shall never sleep because we need you to be <laughs> cranking these out because like after turning the last page, it's like, oh, I have to wait like another year or so. <laughs> it's so painful. But as a writer, I know like it, it takes so long. Um, it takes a while. And so like speaking about this creation, um, one really interesting question is, it is such a rich world that you created with multiple clans, like you said, kind of hierarchical, um, those who weren't in a clan, um, the map, the... Uh, how did you, uh, is this your writing style or is this sort of how you see the world? Because I'm just astounded by this. Yeah, uh, gosh, you know, I love to, to world build. That's, that's, you know, I think the fantasy writers, that's sort of what we live for. Uh, and you know, like I said, I, I grew up on it, you know, so I've been trying to, you know, I've been building worlds uh, from scratch since I was in seventh and eighth grade. Uh, and, um, right. So, so I don't know, it just feels very natural to me. I'll tell you my sort of method for world building. So maybe this is a little bit more insightful. Uh, I had written a version of this, uh, of Black Sun, 95,000 words, turned it into my editor. He was like, Meh, it's okay. I was like, what? It's okay. <laughs> That's not good. That's not good enough. So I took it back. I tore it down to its bones and I really rewrote the story from scratch, uh, saving only a few things. But one of the things I did save was uh, Shiala, my sea captain. Uh, and that was not her name in the first version, but it became her name. And I knew, you know, I wanted her to be a sailor. Uh, so I knew I needed a maritime culture. Uh, and I needed it to be a little bit audacious because she's sort of a hard drinking, hard living, promiscuous, bisexual uh, woman. And I needed, you know, her culture to sort of support that. Uh, and so I started to build out from there. So I said, okay, so I need a seafaring culture. What does that look like? Uh, and then, you know, I need, uh, I want it to be an all female culture. What does that look like? And then, you know, so I do research on the maritime Maya and then I build and build and build. I knew I had Tova and I had Serapio and I knew that Shiala and Serapio needed to meet and she was going to take him to Tova, you know, but the clans I built out, you know, from there, the Sky Maid clans. And then uh, in Fevered Star, you'll find there's another facet to the clans. Uh, but um, yeah, and, and you know, my, my philosophy on uh, world building is I love iceberg world building. And that means sort of like this idea that the story you're telling takes place up here, you know, at the top of the iceberg and all your characters are moving around and living their lives. But below, below the surface, there's a whole world, you know, waiting to be discovered. There's layers and layers of history and lore, you know, and 300 years ago, there was a war and, and this is what happened. And that's how it shapes what you see up top. Uh, but sometimes, you know, the reader might do, you know, a few sort of drills down into the to the iceberg as, as they're reading, you know, cause you've pulled that up as the writer, 
uh, but it should feel like there's a whole sort of underground world or unseen world sort of holding up your world building. Because that's really what I try to do. I want the world to feel rich. I want it to feel grounded. I want it to feel real, you know, like you could live there. Like this is a place with history and culture and stories and, and all sorts of things. So yeah, that's, that's sort of the joy of being a fantasy writer. That's fantastic. But what's interesting is uh, previously you said how much research you had to do. Mm. Um, so one of the questions also kind of going into Shiala and um, um, the crow god. Serapio. Serapio. Um, you really, you do something that's really um, sort of amazing is where you, you link them to nature. So, you know, we're in Minnesota, land of 10,000 lakes, actually we have 12,000. <laughs> um, and so she is able to sing and speak to the water, speak to the waves, speak to those um, beings in the water. Um, I loved that. And then I also love her. Uh, I, I loved um, Serapio, the crow, crow god, um, is able to um, connect with the crows, the beings, to be his eyes. Uh, so, I mean, and in fact, it was so like, uh, I was like last week, I was, you know, finishing off the book and I had my windows open because it's finally warm enough here. And there's like crows or whatever. I was like, <laughs> so, Rebecca, you know? so is this, is this your writing method about just really bringing in this rich sensory or is this sort of how you see the world and hear it? Oh gosh. Um, it might, it might be more my writing. I'm not sure. <laughs> That's a good question. I've never been asked that. That's interesting. You know, I guess it's, maybe it's a bit of both. I will tell you uh, the, how the crow sort of mythos came to be in the story. And maybe that'll give a little bit of uh, insight. Uh, we were living in a house um, when, when I started Black Sun, started thinking about it and then started writing it. We were living in a house sort of on top of a mountain. Uh, and the crows would come. There was a flock of crows uh, that would come and circle the house and just chat, 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 chat. Uh, and I would sit out on the balcony and, you know, sort of visit with them and, you know, chat with them. Uh, and, um, and they're very, you know, they're, like you said, they're very talkative. They'll come and you'll chat, 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 and you'll like say something and they'll say something. And, you know, anyway, uh, so I got really interested in crows because uh, these were like my little friends. And so I did do some crow research. I'll show you. I cannot drop books. Um, there's this great book called The Gift of the Crow. The Gifts of the Crow. And it's uh, how perception, emotion, and thought allow smart birds to behave like humans. And it's awesome. And so I learned a lot about crows. Uh, for example, uh, they hold grudges. Uh, they remember people who have done them wrong. Uh, so they did this experiment. I think I'm a where... crow. <laughs> yes. And so they, I they love did this. An, they did an experiment where... Um, they sent, you know, students out in like Dick Cheney masks, I think it was or something, and they would like harass the crows and do mean things to them. And the crows would remember, and they learned that like Dick Cheney was a bad dude. And so not only do they remember, but then they get, tell their children and their children's children, they like pass it on. Uh, and so I, I was thinking, what if there was a culture that sort of, you know, revered the crow and all these sort of aspects of crowness? And one of them was that they had these long memories, you know, and, and they believed in vengeance uh, and that they had been done a wrong, you know, a genocidal wrong. Uh, then how, how would they go about sort of embodying that crow logic uh, to, to seek their revenge? Uh, and then, you know, and that let me play with ideas of what is justice versus what is vengeance and, you know, what is that fine line you walk, you know, between the two and, and what does that look like? And, you know, all sorts of things, but, but certainly the heart of that came from like crow, from crow culture, you know, and crow logic. Uh, and they do other wonderful things like they have funerals and um, mm -hmm. I don't know, they do, just do very cool stuff. So if you're interested in crows, there's lots of stuff out there to learn about them. But that was really sort of the impetus for creating the crow clan, the carrying crow clan in the book. And of course, Serapio, who is the embodiment of their God. Um, to put him on his path of vengeance. And, and I, I love that you, you sort of gave us a little glimpse into, um, um, I always wanna encourage people, you don't need it, having an MFA in writing is fabulous, but you don't need it. And so you were asking questions, 
you said, what if? Hmm. What if there was a Crow culture? What would it look like? And so these are things that we can all kind of take back and we can ask these questions. And then when you write your book, your chapter, that's you're, you're answering that question. And so thank you for kind of give, giving us a glimpse. So um, I could ask you all my questions, <laughs> but we're going to move more into the live stream questions. And so let's take a look at them. Um, is, oh, somebody wants to know, you spoke about writing poetry uh, when yeah. you were younger. Do you still write poetry or have the itch to? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am a uh, appreciator of poetry. I enjoy reading poetry, but no, no, I, I, I uh, no. It's it's very hard. I really uh, admire people who can read poetry. It's sort of like you know emotion. It's so emotion forward, and and I love writing sort of emotion forward work. Uh, but no, I don't write poetry. I, I peaked in third grade. <laughs> And sometimes it's great to walk away at your peak, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, fabulous. Okay, next question. So now that you're an established author, so thinking about that great opportunity in November, Nano uh, Rimo, do you mm. still do that at all for fun? Mm. Uh, uh, well, once you're an established writer, you have deadlines, uh, and your whole life is Nano Rimo. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, rather than like sort of pushing to write a novel in a month, uh, you know, I'm probably, uh, I also do like TV work and, and things like that. But uh, for a while I was writing two novels a year, uh, which is plenty fast uh, for me. Um, and uh, now I, I have a little more space to breathe. Uh, but um, yeah, no, I don't really do nano anymore because my whole life is nano. I love that. Um, so thinking about the uh, maybe somebody who, um, you know, had an MFA um, or maybe is really wants to be able to start querying, you know, start sending um, their work out. Do you have any tips, um, you know, uh, for for um, on people who are trying to get an agent or anything yeah. like that. Like if you can talk to Rebecca, you know, before you had an agent and um, what advice could you give? Oh, okay. Well, first of all, I was very naive. I had no idea how hard it was to get an agent or how hard it was to get published. I also wasn't a hundred percent sort of invested in this sense of like, oh, if I don't, I will fail because I was very naive <laughs> and I still had my day job. Uh, so, you know, they say, don't quit your day job. That is kind of true uh, until, you know, you can uh, sort of, and do it on, you know, full time. But even then maybe, you know, not every writer has to quit their day job. I mean, you can write for pleasure. You can write a book a year uh, or a book every two or three years. And that's still, you're still a writer. You know, that's still uh, wonderful. You can even write a book and just share it with your relatives, you know, and I think that that counts too. Uh, but if you want to uh, publish, you know, learn about the industry. <laughs> Don't do what I did. Uh, learn a little bit about the industry. Uh, you know, do I did do research on what agent, you know, would be good. Uh, so there are agent websites out there. You can find out what agents, uh, what they're representing. There's something called the manuscript wish list. So you can go to that and, and you could see uh, what sort of stories agents are looking for. Uh, you know, every editor has, you know, different tastes and different things that they want to publish as well. So you can, your agent should help you find a good editor for your work. That's part of their job. Uh, but yeah, you know, I think you keep writing. And, and, and what I had mentioned before that everyone has a story that only they can tell. I really do believe that. I really do think that no matter your background or your history or whatever it is, uh, you are unique. And so the story you bring, your perspective that you bring is going to be unique. And you don't chase trends. Don't try to write for the market or figure out, oh, well, this is selling. So maybe I should do that. Because honestly, it takes about 18 months from the time you sell it to the time it makes it to the shelf. So whatever your trend you're chasing will probably be over. Uh, plus, that's not how good books are written. Good books are written because people, because uh, authors are vulnerable on the page you know, that they're sharing something of themselves, they're opening up, um, they're telling their story, uh, whatever that looks like, uh, and, and people connect, you know, that that's, that's really what mm -hmm. storytelling is, it's, it's our ability to connect with other human beings, 
you know, and to share this emotional experience together. Uh, and that only happens, it only rings true if you're true to your uh, writer voice, your authorial voice. Uh, so that would be, I guess, my advice is to keep writing, keep, keep looking for your voice, trying to find the story that you want to tell that only you can tell. Don't chase trends. Don't try to be like anybody else. You do you. Uh, and I, yeah, things will work out. I love that. <laughs> I don't and know. I, I, know I know you know mentioned hard, about... But... Yeah, I know you mentioned finding kind of your writing community, like a small critique group. Yes. Yeah, I, I love that. I think that's really, really important because it, it's it's so vulnerable to to share your writing, especially if you're mm -hmm. kind of pre-published. Um, and so that's fantastic advice. So um, there are some people that are dying to know because we love Star Wars. Could mm -hmm. you please talk about that experience? Um, the, we, uh, like I, we are so proud that you wrote the Star Wars. I mean, like, uh, like I have this little um, baby Yoda. Yes, we know he's Grogu, but he's like, you know, kind of like to the left of where I write and it's a bobblehead mm -hmm. and whatever. I'm just like inspiration. You know, it's like, come on, Star Wars. Yeah. So could you speak about that? Yeah, that was a wonderful experience. I've actually written a novel for Star Wars and I wrote a Darth Maul short story uh, for an anthology. Um, and just, you know, working with Lucasfilm and working with the editors uh, there, uh, Tom and uh, Jen is like the executive editor at Lucasfilm, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, they're super supportive. Uh, it's much more creative than you would think. I know a lot of people think, oh, if you're writing an IP, an IP is an intellectual property, like another world that you didn't create, right? Uh, so like I've written in for Marvel, I've written for Star Wars, and I didn't create those. I have to work within sort of the confines of those worlds. Uh, but, you know, Star Wars, when I first got the gig, uh, I was pretty nervous. I was like, how am I going to write this? Like, uh, it's so huge and the fans are so intense. <laughs> it's very intimidating. Uh, but I reached out to uh, Daniel Jose Older, uh, who wrote a Han Solo book and now is really deep into like... Uh, the New Republic stuff, um, or the Old Republic, oh, I don't know, <clears throat> the new stuff. Uh, and I asked, you know, Daniel, like, Daniel, what do I do? How do I even start? Uh, and he's like, look, you know, they hired you uh, for you. They've read your stuff. They know what you write, you know, and they don't want you to write the same old Star Wars. They want you to bring, you know, Rebecca's perspective to Star Wars. So you just do what you do best, you know, and it'll work out. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what I did. Uh, you know, I wrote, I feel it's like a very, I was very interested in sort of like how to, how to uh, address the questions left in uh, the wake of The Last Jedi before we go to Rise of Skywalker. I wanted, it was a Poe book. I was given the directives. This is a Poe book. Uh, but um, I really wanted to deal with sort of like Poe's anxiety about leadership and what happens after he leads this mutiny and all of that. Uh, and of course, I needed a little finpo for all the folks out there. Uh, and so, you know, they give you some direction, like they're like, you know, okay, not a lot of uh, Ray in this book. We're saving her for the movies. You, you do Poe and, you know, these other things. And I was like, awesome, I can do that. Uh, and uh, yeah, and they're like, make stuff up. You know, when I would bring uh, ideas of like planets or something, they're like, yes, make up a new planet, make up a new species, make up things that we haven't seen before. Uh, and then when you did need to uh, sort of work with things that already exist, they have a whole team, the story team there to help you. And these people live and breathe Star Wars. So if you're like, uh, you know, I do need to know uh, how I can fix an X-Wing. What can I break in 10 minutes and fix really quick? And they're like, oh, well, here's three options. You can blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, okay, because those are things I would never know. Uh, but anyway, that's, yeah, that's Star Wars. And I got to go to Lucasfilm and I got to go to the uh, Rise of Skywalker uh, premiere, uh, the staff premiere. And so that was just awesome. What a dream. <laughs> wow. Um, and, I, and I think just for, um, you know, myself and um, people who maybe think, you know, once you're an author, you're an author and you, you sort of speak, you, you spoke about um, you know, one, one word, I don't, I think you need to come up with a different one other than, um, imposter syndrome, but you, you're, you're mm -hmm. like oh, uh, star Wars. What, what the heck can I, I know, but, the, right? but the fact yeah, that, <laughs> that, that they, they, they knew you had a worldview, um, and it sounds really supportive. Did you have like, kind of like a, a switch of, um, your, your, um, 
your mentality about like, I, you know, whom hi? And then they're like, no, we need you. And we need you um, like no. think up new I, stuff. I, I, I was terrified the whole time. <laughs> no, until, you know, until it was done, until the editor's like, okay. Cause you know, they give you the sort of directive. They're like, this is what we need. And, you know, and my editor, Tom was like, you know, here's some of the ideas we want, you know, like the sort of knock list and, you know, the stuff like that from the book. Uh, and then they're like, okay, you have four months, go do it. You know, call us when you're done <laughs> or, you know, that sort of thing. So you're kind of like, oh my God, you know, you're, and, and I did write like a, a pretty detailed outline, uh, but, you know, so they knew what I was up to, but you still got to like perform, you know, and, and uh, no, there was never a switch that was like, I got this. It was always like, holy crap, what am I doing? Like you can't, and I remember the first time I wrote uh, a line, you know, and it was like, da 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 Leia said, you know, and like, ooh, chills, you know? Princess Leia, I just wrote Princess Leia, like, you know, dialogue, what the heck? Uh, so no, I'm still sort of in awe. It's still like a really a place of wonder. It's very, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> it is pretty cool. And like I said, all us indigenous authors were just like, <laughs> Yeah, that's right. And I did put um, natives in in uh, Resistance Reborn. I don't know if anybody noticed, but there's a couple. <laughs> yep. And I love that because people need to see that. I, I you know, yeah. it always seems, you know, and what's going on in, uh, you know, the finally, you know, our Auntie Deb Hallen, our Secretary of the Interior, mm. you know, is coming out with this these horrendous facts that we always knew about um, yeah. about the history of Native American boarding schools. And I, I and I just think that's why I'm always, I always wanna shine a light to amazing indigenous writers because we've always known this. And I think a lot of us write about the amazing Native people that we've always known about, that we've always wanted to be a part of um, and the, the community. And so I just think that's amazing. So. Um, so sort of alongside that Star Wars, somebody wants to know about writing with Rick Ray Harden's um, mm -hmm. series. Could you speak about that? Uh, yeah, so I did write a middle grade novel called Race to the Sun. It's on the Rick Riordan imprint. Uh, and, you know, I wrote that one pretty much for my daughter, uh, who is now 14. But I think at the time of the novel, maybe she was 11. Uh, and uh, her dad is Navajo. Uh, and I'm very familiar with Navajo traditional stories. Uh, and so I use those as sort of the base of the book, but really it's about friendship. Uh, it's about difficult mother-daughter relationships. Uh, uh, it's about, you know, sort of finding the hero within yourself uh, instead of trying to um, become what other people say you should be. Uh, but, but so that was, a, that again, Good people. Uh, Rick Riordan is absolutely a joy, and his editor Stephanie uh, Laurie, uh, wonderful people. Uh, you know, and he's really doing it right, bringing in like various authors, yeah, to like really expand the world of, of sort of mythic storytelling uh, beyond just you know sort of the Greek and the Roman and the Norse. And you know, he's really uh, reaching out and doing wonderful things. And he's great to work with. They're good people. My daughter got to meet him and take pictures with him. And so for that short, brief period of time, I was a cool mom. And now I am back to not being a cool mom, but that's okay. <laughs> Welcome to the club. Yes. <laughs> um, and and, and, I, and sort of with that, um, I love that, uh, like my, my, like when I say things, my, we have two girls and, and they're like, oh, mom, is this another life lesson? Just tell us when it's over, you know? So, but that's the great thing, right? You could, like you said, you can sort of write these life lessons um, mm -hmm. as a love letter to your child for them, yeah. children, for them to read later on. Um, so uh, we could speak a lot about this being a um, author and, a, and a, um, a parent, but somebody would love to know, could you tell us um, what is going to come next for the next installment for the series um so for favorite son do we in a, the next one is is there going to be a different point of view um what could you what, what sort of snippets can you you share with um, us um so i can't say much uh 
I could tell you that uh, as Black Sun was sort of the Serapio book, right? He's on the cover, it's very focused on him. Uh, Favorite Star is very much a Narampa book. Uh, that's her on the cover. Uh, the third book, uh, whose title I cannot tell you, uh, will very much be a Shiala book. Uh, and so, uh, and you'll also, of course, you know, there's sort of a war brewing and you'll, you'll, uh, all of that will sort of come to conclusion and everything that's sort of happening in Tova and, you know, and, and all of that will all come to a conclusion, but, uh, certainly Shiala is gonna, uh, be your girl. She's gonna have her glow up. Uh, in this book, which I'm- We love it all, but I'm going to say Minnesota, especially any, any, um, any water lover. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> super excited, super yes. excited for that. And yeah. so um, let's see, I think we've got about nine minutes left. Let's see if mm -hmm. we have a couple more questions. Um, and I do, let's see. Oops. Oh, I do have a question. So a lot of times we writers are, you know, there, there's this kind of canon of, you know, write what you know, author. But a lot of times we need to write characters that we don't know. So for example, mm -hmm. would you be able to, like I, I, like I, I mentioned um, Serapio, how he did not have physical vision. He was mm -hmm. able to tap into the crows. Um, were you able to speak um, about, um, how do you, if you don't have that mm -hmm. loss of vision, how did you write um, his character in that aspect so well? Yeah, so Serapia was blind uh, and uh, I had disability consultants. Uh, I did, uh, first I started, I did some basic research. There's a whole series of books that are like, um, I guess, you know, if you're going to write this kind of character, don't F it up. Here's your basic rules, you know? And so this was like how not to write blind characters. Don't do this stuff. Uh, and then I had two disability consultants, uh, Rose Sosi, uh, who um, had a degenerative blindness uh, later in life, but, or I guess maybe in her midlife, because uh, she did have to go to blind school. And, and so Serapio's, uh, his time with his tutors and his wood carving is very inspired by Rose's uh, experiences. Uh, and then I had uh, uh, Elsa, whose name I'm going to mess up, but she's a, a Hugo award-winning author herself, uh, who is deafblind. Uh, and she read the manuscript uh, and she uh, corrected uh, any places I had mistakes, although if any got through and anything is offensive, totally my fault. Elsa was wonderful. Uh, but, you know, she helped me understand things like, um, try to stay away from the, the blind magic trope. You know, if he's gonna have, you know, sort of hearing, you know, then it's because he worked at it. It's because you have to train yourself. It's not like he's all of a sudden has super magic hearing or something, uh, you know, or how to understand uh, how to use um, uh, devices that help you get around uh, more so than, um, uh, again, relying on magic and things. So even though it is fantasy and uh, he definitely has powers got you know that his god and the crows have given him uh, I tried to make him um I guess uh recognizably blind to blind readers as well uh which you know whether I succeed or fail is up to them uh but certainly uh that sort of representation mattered to me and to try to get the dis disability rep correct mattered to me uh you know there's also a lot of um uh, non-binary rep in the book uh, mm -hmm. and you know it was very much the same I, I tried to do a good job you know to try to represent that on the page and to sort of represent again indigenous cultures uh, often uh, historically did not were not uh, had had various genders you know we they, mm -hmm. we weren't so um, caught in this binary uh, that's yeah. really and a, still do which yeah I, I that's yes. why I was the the different pronouns I was yes. I mean yeah that's um no, I love that. And I, and, and um, Serapio's, I mean, I love the, um, the carving where, like you said, it, it's, it's a learned um, aspect um, yeah. and not rely on, on the magic, you know, um, to yeah. mysticize that. I think that was fantastic. Um, I think, um, 
We've got about five minutes, mm -hmm. um, a little left. Uh, one of the things that I am really curious about is that, so you wrote, you write about um, the character's dreams. And for example, the dream walking, how somebody can kind of scoop into the dream. Um, was this a part of your writing? Uh, do dreams inspire you? Uh, do they inspire um, you to help with your characters? Um, I'm somebody, I think like a lot of people, um, I have very vivid dreams. I got plots and subplots and I tell it to my husband the next day, he's like, who are you? <laughs> so could you speak a little bit about that? Um, is this something that's woven throughout all your writing or was this really important for this series? Uh, yeah, so I guess two thoughts. Um, I am a, a lucid dreamer uh, to a certain degree. I do try to use dreams for my writing. So often I will uh, go to bed, you know, sort of in that time when you're sort of sleepy, but you're not quite asleep. I try to work through scenes. I'm a very visual writer. Uh, so I really see the scenes happening. You know, I see them, you know, sort of acting out and then it's my job to sort of write them down. Uh, so I do that. I try to work through uh, plot problems and things like that when I'm in that state. Um, and then of course the, the dream walking in uh, Fevered Star uh, is much more nefarious. <laughs> it's a little more like Inception. Uh, type dream walking, I guess. And you'll get uh, a bit more of that, of course, in the third book. Uh, but um, yeah, just, I guess, just this idea uh, that, you know, our dreams and our life, our living, you know, consciousness are not so separate. Uh, and so I really wanted, you know, sort of touch on that. Um, yeah. And, and a place where the gods, like dream, the dream world is a place where the gods uh, have more power, I guess. Yeah, Odon, you're uh, muted. You would think after like two years into this thing, we would figure Still it out. Um, so um, I have one audience question and then we're going to do like the fun lightning round non oh, okay. questions that I really want to know. Um, but somebody asked about Trail of Lightning. Um, they, they love the character as we all do. Um, any more installments? Any secret news you can not share with us? <laughs> um, so, you know, publishing is fickle <laughs> and lots goes on behind the scenes uh, that us authors can't always uh, control. Uh, so I would say uh, never say never, yeah. uh, but not right now, no. I had a, my first book, Apple in the Middle, I had a, a my first fan mail from a, like a 13 year old, 14 year old boy. He said, are you gonna write another sequel? Cause I like your book. It's fine if you don't, I'm okay with that. <laughs> but I, I love that. Um, way. <laughs> before I do the lightning round, non-serious questions um, to end out our fabulous evening. Um, no, actually I have the question here. Okay, okay. are you ready? Serious, sure. non-serious questions. Uh, okay. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Uh, sweet food, salty food? Oh, salty. Early bird, night owl? Oh, either. I can do either. <laughs> we when have I'm... kids. You got it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, iPhone, Android? Oh, Android. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> my kids tell me, I'm like, they're like, oh, mom, you're so old fashioned. So <laughs> Okay, warm weather, cool weather. Oh, cold, cold. I live in the desert, but it's the high desert. It's quite cold. It used to be before climate change. But yeah, <laughs> we'll okay. All right, what is your favorite writing spot this week? Oh, coffee shop, for sure. Hmm. Uh, do you need a uh, sound or silence when you write? No, uh, I wear headphones. I do have the noise canceling, but... Uh, for every project, every new novel, I build a playlist. Uh, and so I am working to that playlist. Even if it plays 50 times in a row as I'm sitting there, uh, it really helps me set the mood and the tone. It's sort of Pavlovian. It gets me in like the time, the mindset to write. Uh, so I am playing my playlist. Love it. Um, as a writer, uh, writers will understand this. Are you a plotter or pantser? I am a little bit of both, but mostly a plotter. I plot about 80% and then I leave 20% uh, to the muse. Uh, and, and I'm not a stickler for my 
outline. So if I outline 80%, if it starts to go in a different direction, that's okay. I love it. All right. Well, thank you. We are coming to the end. So um, this is all the time that we have for the evening. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for penciling us into your busy May. Um, <laughs> this was fabulous to talking to you. And so just as a reminder, this has been a virtual presentation of Club Book, which is a long running series of MELSA made possible by the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Thank you so much again, a special thanks to the St. Paul Public Library for the part they played in bringing Rebecca to us. And before you log off, make sure you look at the book club survey link, which is in the comments and will be projected in the place of my video momentarily. And so if you haven't already, please, please remember to order your own copy of Fevered Star, courtesy of Red Balloon Bookshop. And so the link too is in the comments. Have a great night, everybody. Miigwech, thank you so much, Rebecca. It was an honor to be with you all. And uh, Gigawaman, I hope to see everybody um, very soon. Thank you so much. What a wonderful, you, what a wonderful yeah. talk. Thank you, everyone.